Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to start with uh, giving you a quiz. Um, I will say word, and you give me opposite word, word with the opposite meaning. For example, man, short, smart, no, smart, not so smart, <laughs> obedience, spirit. Faith, fear. So all of us as Christians, we want to lead the life in obedience. We want to be led by the Spirit, not by our flesh. And we want to lead a life of faith, not gripped by fear. But if we decide to go in opposite way, and instead of being led by the Spirit, instead of leading life of obedience, and we just... Uh, are satisfied with a partial obedience, which is a disobedience, or we reject our God and we look at circumstances and instead of living by faith and we live by sight, what's going to happen to our life? Because there are always consequences to our decisions. The choices that we make in our daily life will bring results in tomorrow. So as we continue on with a series on a man after God's own heart, as we hear the story of life of David, that we are going into the chapter in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now before we introduce David, because this is a famous story in the chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. All my kids loved this story as they grew up. In fact, we played together how David destroyed, defeated the giant Goliath. Even outside of church, in the world, those people who do not believe in Jesus, those people who are atheists will know a story about how small boy David defeated the giant Goliath. Now, before the Bible introduces David, there is a battlefield. It's called the Valley of Elah. There, before God brought David, there's a, something is happening in that occasion. That is a byproduct of the people, including King Saul and his entire army, decided to go opposite way. Instead of being led by the Spirit, they're led by the flesh. Instead of living by faith, they decided to live by sight. And instead of leading the life of obedience, they decided to be satisfied with a partial obedience. And that byproduct, that consequences, that result is exactly what's happening in the valley of Allah, in the battlefield that Saul and his army are confronted with the Goliath and the army of Palestine. And that's what we are going to look at before we introduce David the mighty warrior, but shepherd boy who is anointed with the God's Spirit. What's happening in that valley will give us a lesson, a sober lesson. When faith is gone, when anointing is diminished, when we decide to live by sight, and when we are content with a partial obedience, and when we reject our God in our heart, that's what we are going to confront in our life the giant Goliath, but seemingly he becomes invincible to us. So we are gripped by fear. So let's turn our Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We are going to go from verse 1 through 16. So let us alternate. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sokar, which belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Sokar and Azekar in Ephesus, 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 Damin. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, which a valley between them.
He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Amen. So the Philistine, the army, was invading the nation of Israel. Always this nation, the people group, had been a snare on the side of Israel. And to understand Valley of Allah, where it's located, I want us to see a map. This is what's happening. So you see uh, Azka and Saka in between, there are two armies confronting each other. That's an Israelite, Israelite army position, and that's a Philistine army position. In between, there's a creek. It's a kind of bad, but there's no water. It's a valley of Allah. And if you look at the next map, where the valley of Allah is located, you can see the Jerusalem up there on the right side, the northern part, and that's how far distance from Jerusalem. So that's the battlefield, the Two armies are confronting each other. Now, there is a great spiritual significance to understand what's going on in that valley. Because it takes us back to the older time where Moses heard the voice of God and God commanded it to Israelites, when you go into the land of Canaan, which I give you as a promise, that you will possess the land. When you go there, there will be Hadens, there will be Gentiles, there will be the people group who worship idols, and their wickedness, their sins and iniquities have come before me. So as you go there, completely wipe them out, destroy them, because that land belongs to you, and I give that land as a gift to you. That was the commandment. But however, if you do not drive them out completely, this is what's going to happen. He said it through Moses in the book of Numbers, chapter 33, verse 55. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. So these are Philistines. They were a small tribe, and even in today's, the land of Israel, they lived in the Gaza district. And they are descendants of Gath, and they are descendants of Anakim. Remember, ten spies, including Caleb and Joshua, twelve of them went in to spy out the land. But ten spies returned back, and they were so afraid because instead of walking by faith, but they decided to walk by sight, and they looked at these giants, descendants of Anakim, and they reported with an evil report. We went there, and these were such giants, and we felt like we were grasshoppers before them. And because of that, 
God was in wrath. But anyhow, God said, these tribes, if you do not completely drive them out, and you let remnants live alongside with you, they will become thorns on your side, and there will be irritants your eyes, in your eyes. So whenever Israelites, they fully worship God and walk in the obedience, keeping ordinance of God, and they were stronger than remaining tribes. They subdued them, and they become subject, and they gave tributes to the nation of Israel. However, when the Israelites, they began to live a life of disobedience and began to worship different idols, then these tribes will become stronger and stronger, and they will invade the nation of Israel, and they really became snails on their side. What's happening right here is that because of Saul rejected God, and God rejected him. So the entire nation of Israel, they were weakened. That's why Philistine will come to the side, and they began to invade them. That's exactly what's happening. But when you look at Saul, what has happened is because he also partially obeyed God. Not only the Israelites partially obeyed God's command because they were not able to completely drive all the haters out. So that was a partial obedience. And King Saul, his life is also portrayed as a man who was content with a partial obedience. Why? When God commanded him through Samuel, why don't you go and completely kill all the Amalekites? Do not leave anything, both men and women, young and old, and even all the animals who are breathing, you destroy them all. Kill them all. Wipe them out. However, what did Saul do? He was content with the partial obedience. He left the sheep and goat, which were blameless, to offer as a sacrifice unto the Lord, because he heeded the voice of the people rather than the voice of God. So he was content with the partial obedience, and the people of Israel, in general, historically, they were content with the partial obedience. So that's my product of what's happening on the battlefield. When we disobey our God, when we decided to be content with a partial obedience, then we may confront our own Palestine army. And Goliath may be the byproduct of our disobedience in our life. So when our anointing is diminished, King Saul, because he rejected the voice of God, God said, I reserve you. And because he was rejected by God, and anointing has been diminished, So instead of walking by faith, now he's walking by sight. And all his army, including himself, are gripped by fear. That's what we are left with. When we decide to be content with a partial obedience, and when we decide to walk not by faith, but by sight, and when we decide to reject our God from our heart, that we will be gripped by fear in front of our own Goliath and the Philistine. So that's what, exactly what's happening. They couldn't do anything about it. See, remember these people, the army of Saul and all these Israelites at that time, what did they do? We need a king. Give us a king. So God was a grievous, and Samuel was a grievous. But God told Samuel, do not be grievous because they are demanding king. They did not reject you, but they rejected me. So they were looking for a human king, elevating human more than God. They rejected God from their heart, so they wanted to see a leader, a king, that is visible to their eyes, just like a hidden word. Give us a king, give us a king, according to our own fleshly desires and pleasures. And God heeded their voice. So whom did God choose according to their desire because they decided to live not by faith because of living by faith is too difficult because our God is invisible God. We want to see king that is 
visible so we can touch him. We can hear his voice clearly and we can converse with him. We can follow him visual, visual, with a visual effect. And God hid in their voice. So whom did God choose? A man most handsome in the entire nation of Israel. His height was a, a shoulder higher up, taller than anybody in the nation of Israel. So according to their eyes, he was the man. He was the best man, best looking, tallest man. Outwardly, he is the contender. So the people of God decided to live by sight, not by faith. So all these people, both Saul and Israelites, they go hand by hand. They're the same kind of people. And they're stuck in front of Goliath. Because they become enslaved to the fear, because they were content with the partial obedience, because they decided to live by sight, because they rejected God in their hearts, now they're left with a Goliath and his Philistine army, but they cannot be moving forward because they're gripped by fear. That's exactly what happens when we follow Saul's pattern. This is how people who live by sight will happen. Because if they look at Goliath, he's, you know, it's, it has an old Israelite measurement, but in today's English measurement, he's nine feet, nine inches tall. He's a giant, humongous. What he's wearing in the pound, it's 175 pounds. The spearhead of whatever he's holding, the spear, the head itself is a 15 pounds. He wears a helmet, he has a shoulder pads, and he has a coat of mail, and everything is covered. Not only that, in front of him, there's a shield bearer. There's a soldier who carries a large shield in front of him. There's no way anybody can destroy this invincible Goliath. That's result of those people, including Saul, decided to live by sight. So in their sight, Goliath appears. There's no space. There's no hole. They can shoot an arrow or they can put a sword into him that he can be killed. That's why they're frightened. They're shivering and they're trembling. And oftentimes... In our own our life, circumstances, financial problems, relational problems, whatever it can be, that we confront our own Goliath. But if we continually perpetuate it with a life of partial obedience and led by the flesh and live by sight and rejected our God from our heart, then when the Goliath attack us, invade our life, and we are stuck and we are frozen, gripped by fear. But this is very interesting because what he's claiming and what the Bible is saying, I believe God purposefully making sharp contrast between Saul and David because everything that is written in the Old Testament that are written for our own benefit, for our own admonition as an example. So God purposefully making sharp contrast between Saul and David, inviting us, encouraging us to be like David, not like Saul. Because if you follow, if you follow a pattern of Saul, you will end up becoming like a Saul. But it's a very interesting. Twice in the Bible, it purposefully mentions that three older sons of Jesse, they followed Saul. On verse 13, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And then verse 14 again, David was the youngest. God is making contrast. There are all the three sons, but David is the youngest, but the older three sons 
followed Saul. He repeats himself. Twice mentioned, these three sons followed Saul. Why? Because there's a common denominator between Saul and three older sons. They look fabulous in the sight of the people. They were handsome. They're tall. And that's why Samuel for momentarily was deceived, was deceived. And he was about to anoint Eliab because they looked so fabulous outside in the sight of men. But what is a common denominator of four men? Both Saul and three sons of Jesse were all rejected by God. But probably in their hearts, they already rejected the word of God. That's why God rejected them. So what's happening is, with the entire army of Israel and the older three sons who follow the soul, and God is telling us, see, you see what's happening. I rejected the soul. Three older sons were rejected by me already. So same kind click together. For whom you follow, you are the same kind. What kind of people you draw to your life are the same people. I can tell what kind of person you are by what kind of people follow you. So the rejected king will draw the rejected older son. And all the army of Israel, they are the same pattern, but except David. Because there's no mention David is following Saul because he follows Almighty God in his heart. That's the difference. So when we examine our life, what kind of people am I drawing to my life? Are they spiritual? Are they the people who want to follow and live by faith? Are they people who truly worship God? Or are they people who follow me, constantly compromise in their lifestyle? Then I may be the one because of the same kind will lead and draw the same kind of people. So typically, generally, for what kind of people that attract me, that's who I am. That's who I am. Always, the complaint, com those people who complain will draw those people who easily complain together. Those are people who always compromise in their lifestyle, they will always draw the same people together who end up drinking, who are addicted to the substance, who are sexually lustful and fornicating. Same kind of people will cling together and become a group. But these people, content with a compromise, content with a partial obedience, will be stuck and gripped by fear when giant Goliath appears in their life. But it's very interesting to hear what Goliath is crying out. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 10 says, The Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Earlier, he said, Am I not a Philistine? You the servants of Saul. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. He's humiliating God's people. He's a humiliating army of Israel. He's a humiliating King Saul. But no one is able to dare to come and confront the Goliath. Why? Because they walk by sight. Because they cannot look at Goliath in the perspective of faith, trusting God. That he himself is a grasshopper in the sight of the Lord. But in their sight, it's, he is an invincible giant. So they are trembling. They are trembling. But the outcry of giant Goliath, he says, give me a man. Give me a man. Is there any man who is bold enough to fight against me in the army of God? Isn't there any man who trusts God solely and come before me and defeat me? And I believe right next to that Goliath. There are many, many women cry out, give us a man. 
Give us a man, man of integrity, man of humility, man who work by faith that they do not compromise their life in hidden places. Lord, give us a man, man of God, that may be outcries of ladies, both inside the church and outside the church. Maybe in the household, wives are crying out, give us a man, man of humility, man who takes full responsibilities as a man in the house. The societies are crying out, give us a man. We need a man of God, man of integrity, man of faith, man of responsibility, man who solely relies upon God, man of humility. In this world, even nowadays, inside a church, we lack men. Just like thousands of years ago, in that valley of Allah, there was no man. There was no man. Out of that army, entire army, including Kim himself, this giant Goliath defying the army of God, he cries out, give me a man. There was no man. They looked like a man, but there was absolutely no man. And today, it's not that much different. Societies are crying out, give us a man. Wives are crying out, give us a husband who is so faithful, who is committed, who is uncompromising, who is also with a humility, who is man of prayer. And the nations are crying out, give us a man, rescue us from captivity of Satan, deliver us. Give us a man who will come, who will forsake and abandon everything and take the gospel and come to us and rescue us. The whole world is crying out, give me a man. And our desire is to that calling, here I am. I am the man. I am the man. I am the man of God who will come even though I am small, even though I am nobody, even though I don't have any possession, even though I don't have any position, even though I don't have any crown on my head, but I have an anointing of the Holy Spirit, and God is with me. And wherever there is an outcry of give us a man, that I will go. I'm the man you are crying out for. May we be such men rising up within our church, in our ministry. You know, every time I read 1 Samuel, I have a sincere desire deep inside that I want to be like a David, but I find myself all the time that I'm like a Saul, and I end up repenting because I'm content with the partial obedience, and I live by sight, not by faith. And in my heart, our, my God is a distanced, and I repent. But there's an encouragement. While we know that God wants all of us to be men and women after God's own heart, but we realize everybody in this room, I believe, will attest ourselves that, Pastor Shine, instead of being like a David, I'm like a King Saul. I'm like one of those armies. I'm like those three older sons, and I feel like that too. But there's encouragement because we are the victors in Christ Jesus. What Christ has done on the cross, his crucifixion and his resurrection has paved for us way because that anointing that rested upon King Saul is completely different than the anointing that has come upon us because that anointing was the anointing of slave. So when he makes a mistake, when he disobeys, when he is content with a partial obedience, the anointing is diminished completely, and evil spirit will dominate him. But us, no. Even though we failed, even though we partially obeyed, even though we rebelled against God so many times, many, many more times than King Saul, but the spirit that is in us will never forsake us, never leave us. We may grieve him. Seven times we fall. Seven in Hebrew number is a complete. 
there's absolutely no more chance for you to fall. You've done it. Seven times you have fallen. But the Bible says, on the eighth time, the righteous shall rise up. God will come and hold our hand. Yes, you have failed so miserably. You said to yourself, it's done. It's done. But God will come and take our hands and lift us up. That's what in Christ Jesus, even though we may have failed like a King Saul many, many times, thousands of times. But however, in Christ Jesus, God comes because I will never forsake you. Because I have already ordained and designed you to be a man after God's own heart. A woman after my own heart. Because when the society and the world and nations and our neighbors are cry out, give us a man, give us a woman of God. That's whom you, I, I called you to be. Although you failed, although you fell seven times, an eighth time, I rise you up. Even in this world. There are many, many men and women who have failed miserably many, many times. We have a Disneyland nearby us. We know Walt Disney was a great man of business and also creative ideas. But did you know he got fired by newspaper chief of editor because he lacked ideas? Can you believe it? A man with a creative ideas, he got fired by a newspaper company because he lacked the ideas. And he multiple times had to file bankruptcies. But he was able to later build Disney Empire. We know Edison, before he was able to make right filament for the light bulb, he failed 2,000 times. He tried 2,000 times and 2,000 times did not work until he was able to make one right filament for the light bulb. Some of us are baseball fans. Babe Ruth, he's known, he's a legend in the baseball. He has a record of home runs, but not many people know. He also holds records of strikeouts. Us as a Christians, even though we fail, even though we fall, Seven times, thousand times, as much as we desire to be like a David, but we see ourselves gripped by fear in the front of the Goliath. And Saul miserably failed, did not have a chance. But because of Christ, hallelujah, praise be the name of Jesus. Because of Jesus, he comes and lifts us up again. And you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, my spirit, my anointing that rests upon you will be never taken away. No matter how many times you fail, two times you, two thousand times you fail, on the two thousand first, I will make you a man and woman after my own heart. Let us arise. Although the Bible purposefully, before the Bible introduces the shepherd boy David who will defeat the giant Goliath, sharper contrast has a seen in the valley of Allah between Philistine and Israelite's army. And sometimes, oftentimes, we find ourselves like a King Saul, because of our compromise, because of our partial obedience, because of our walking by sight, not by faith, because of our rebellion against God, whatever it may be. God always desires us to stand up again and be firm. Whatever areas that need Repentance. Let us repent before God. If there is a discouraged spirit, 
There's no other final discouragement, disappointment in Christ Jesus. There's always if time. There's always if time. There's always if time. As we desire to be like David, let us ask God, help me, Lord, come out of this life of soul. Lord, anoint me, protect me, guide me, lead me. The Goliath that I am confronting in my own life, give me a sleep that I come in the name of the Lord and give us the strength to defeat our own Goliath. So let's call the name of Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, 